welcome. We're, uh, we're starting today a seven-week journey as a church um, that we hope will um, set some things in motion for every single person for their whole of their lives or for the rest of their lives, depending on, you know, how old you are. Um, that we're hoping it will really lead to some great impact. We're starting a, a journey called the Emotionally Healthy Discipleship. Emotionally Healthy Discipleship. It's happening on Sundays, and it's happening in every small group throughout Curate. And it was so great even here at the 9 a.m. just seeing new groups begin, people who weren't in groups getting in groups. Uh, I got my group ready to go, and it was already full before the 9 a.m., but now it's even more full. Uh, and so it's going to be awesome what's happening. I just want to start by saying this is going to be an amazing journey, but Sundays aren't enough. And so I'm just going to be super honest with it. If you don't get in a group over these next seven weeks, you will miss out on a huge chunk of what God wants to do in your life and with your life over these next seven weeks. And I reckon everyone can make some space for the next seven weeks. So just throw that out there. You can... Go on the app, you can go on the website, it's right at the top, find a group, put in your details, someone will help you find one, or afterwards, there will be opportunity as well, and so just throw that out there, want you to get the most out of it, um, emotionally healthy discipleship, has the opportunity to bless every part of your life, if you get more emotionally healthy, it will bless your marriage, it will bless your future, it will bless your family, It'll make you better at work. It'll make you better in every part of your life, such as the power. And uh, I want to give credit to Pete Scazzaro, who wrote uh, the books Emotionally Healthy. There's a few different titles, Emotionally Healthy Discipleship, Spirituality, Leadership. These are powerful books. And if you haven't read one of them, I would suggest you get one, whether it's on Kindle or audiobook or whatever you do, because it's just another way of going deeper. These books have deeply impacted my life as they have millions of people around the world. And I think it's a conversation that only needs to be having been had more often, I believe. Look, many of you would know... Um, some of my story over the last few years that it's almost two years ago that I sat in a psychologist's office, psychologist that I saw frequently, and he gave me the dreaded diagnosis that I didn't want, where he looked at me and he said, look, you've got to face it, you're burnt out. And I was like, no, no, maybe browned out. Maybe something like a, he's like, no, you, you need to face the music this is where you've got to. And after many years in ministry and many years of living a full life and family and being on the go and trying to do all that we could in our years for God, I got to the place where I didn't have anything else to give. And it was it's humbling. It's humbling to go from a person that's get up and go in the morning to not wanting to get out of bed in the morning. It was hard to you know, be someone who was full of life and excited about preaching and those things to, to like facing huge anxiety and sort of panic attacks at the thought of even having to come on a Sunday. From someone that was decisive and had vision to somebody who couldn't see the future anymore. And uh, it's actually a lot of the stuff in the material that we'll be talking about over these next few weeks that's a big part of why I'm still here. A big part of why we're all still here. And uh, so I'm excited for us to, to go through it. I think he wraps language around something that we all need, which is greater emotional health. You know, we can't keep going like we have. Even just when you turn to the media over recent weeks and as it relates to the church, as sad as it is, it's only further indicator that the church needs a greater level of emotional health. We need healthier forms of discipleship. We need to go deeper. And I pray every day for every person who's a part of Kira, I pray that we would get healthier and deeper. That's one of my things on my prayer requests. And for that to happen, we need to embrace this emotional health conversation. I know there's some people out there, maybe some men will be like, you know, this isn't my favorite church topic, getting in touch with my feelings or something like that. But emotional health is central to spiritual health. 
And for too long have we let, you know, have we tried to think that we could become spiritually healthy without actually becoming emotionally healthy. And we think of salvation in terms of saying a prayer and receiving the gift of righteousness and hope because of what Jesus has done. And it certainly is that, but the word saved doesn't just mean a transaction happens. It means that we become whole. That actually what God wants for us in our saved experience is that we would become healthy spiritually. Yes, at a soul level, that would become healthy emotionally. Yes, that would become healthy physically. That our, our whole being relationally, that actually we would enter the saved life, this whole life. And that's what Jesus wants for every single one of us. So we must embrace the emotional things that actually hold us back. The reality is, is we're in a day and age where we have more language for emotional health or dysfunction than we've ever had before. We've got more pills, we've got more openness, we've got more dialogue, we've got more counselors, we've got more psychologists, we've got more of all the tools we need to help us, yet we're not getting healthier. Our relationships are more dysfunction, addictions are growing, marriages are falling apart, families are torn apart, people don't know how to get along in church. So just because we have the word Christian over our lives doesn't mean we've figured this stuff out. And hey, we're not going to arrive anywhere over the next seven weeks, let's be honest, but we're going to start something. And we're going to, we're going to get something going in our lives so that we might become saved, so we might experience it in all of our lives. We must go deeper. I think one of the failures over the years, and I'll, I'll accept this one, uh, and we can put that image up, that's perfect, is that we see church like this sometimes. People like me see church like this. We want to see people meet Jesus. We want to see them attend. Fantastic. Tick. Good job. We want to see you connect, serve, and give, because you know we want to get, see you in a group, because we know that helps. We want to see you serve, because everybody has gifts that are supposed to be used in the church and in this world, and give, because we're all supposed to be generous people, and we're like, cool, we're doing our job. We're impacting the world. You know, the problem with that is, is that you can connect and you can attend and you can serve and you can give, but you can be an emotional ruin in your discipleship life. You can actually have so much dysfunction there that you might be doing all these right things, but you are not mature at all. And for, for in recent years, sadly, People like me have reduced church down to this. And we've gone, oh, look, they're involved, they're connected, they're becoming generous. Tick, 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 job done. Let's just set them on autopilot and that should be fine. But we all know the reality that that does not mean that anything has been done. While those things are important, you can't, let's just stop there. You cannot be a mature Christian without doing those things. Those are indicators of maturity, but they're just not causes of maturity. Just because you do them doesn't mean you're going to become somebody. This is about us digging deeper beneath the surface. Those things, if you would like in this next model here, yeah, they are the things, the, the connect, serve, and give. That's the stuff you can see at the tip of the iceberg. But we need to deal with the stuff that's beneath the waters, that's in the depth of who we are. And we need to open up conversations around that so Jesus can come into those places. And his principles can reform our lives in that way. I think we've failed at emotional health as churches in general because we've tolerated emotional immaturity. We've let people be gifted and we've let them serve even though they might be emotional wrecks everywhere else in their life. We've tolerated gifted leaders and pastors who are also detached spouses and angry parents. We let people function as leaders, yet they're unteachable, insecure, and defensive. We've let people quote scripture, pray, fast, and we've accepted them still being judgmental and critical. We just call it discernment. We let people lead people, even though their heart isn't to serve, it's actually to be admired. We tolerate people that are deeply hurt, but won't deal with it because they want to avoid conflict at all costs. 
We let people serve tirelessly, and we think they're doing great, even though in the inside they carry deep resentment because their time is too full and they're not taking care of themselves. Or we let people be a part of church for years without ever getting to the point where they share any weaknesses or struggles with anyone else. And if as long as they're doing the right spiritual things, we go, job well done. We tolerate emotional immaturity. We've disconnected emotional health from spiritual health. But we're whole people. You can't have one without the other. Wherever you're unhealthy, it will affect the health level of everything else. Our love for God is absolutely measured by our love for others. But you can't truly love others if you're not emotionally well on the inside. All you can do is loving things, but there's a difference between doing loving things and actually being a loving person. And here's the crazy thing. We live in a culture, as I said, that's more open to emotional conversations before, than ever before, but we also live in a culture that could be defined as a culture of sensuality, like a culture where we're actually driven by our feelings. Feelings are so important to us. Like They've never been important to other cultures before to the level that they're important to our culture, to the point that if we say to somebody that they shouldn't do something that they feel they should do, people will call that a type of abuse. That's how much feelings matter in our culture. And we should be able to live from our feelings better, but we need our feelings to be redeemed. We need our feelings to be reshaped. We need them to be replaced and to be healed. Jesus led from a very healthy feeling life. And we need to be able to have these conversations so ours can be transformed to be like His. It's sad, but many of us can grow up in years and we can grow up in church and we can do this thing for decades, but we can still be big babies emotionally. But it doesn't have to be that way. Jesus wants to take us to somewhere better. I think we've failed sometimes in these emotional, healthy conversations because we've emphasized doing for God over being with God. I'm going to talk a lot about that today. I think we've failed because we've ignored the treasures of church history. As awesome as evangelicalism is and as awesome as our sort of Pentecostal charismatic sort of DNA as a church is, you know, it's about a hundred years old. It doesn't have a rich history in knowing how to see people's lives actually formed in Christ from the innermost being. It's good at praying in tongues and creating an impactful church service. It's not so good at seeing people formed on Monday to Saturday in their life and giving them tools to really encounter God in every moment of their life. And I'm thankful for our tradition, but we need to realize there's 2,000 years of church history, of well-worn paths, of ancient paths that show us a way to a holistic health that need to be embraced. And I think, lastly, that we've defined success wrongly. And I think even we could even, like, yeah, we could replace our definition of success for sure. But I think we need to question even our obsession with the idea of success. I wonder if, you know, in our time, we think that we need a definition of success. We need something to aim for, but... I just, I don't see that when you read cultures over the centuries of being obsessed with any definition of success. Certainly in Christendom, they didn't just get a better definition. They actually focused on something else entirely, like faithfulness. And I think some of those things need to be reprogrammed. It leaves us with this, and we can put the funnels up. Often church is seen like this. How many people can you get to attend? Oh, yep, it's looking all right today. How many people can we get to connect? Oh, we get some of those people to serve, and we hope with some of those people serving that some of them are actually living their lives with a sense of go on the mission of God in their lives. The reality is, is that very few of you who attend probably live your daily experience with the sense of go, with the sense of purpose. And that just shouldn't be the case. 
And I'm sorry for any way that we've robbed you of the discipleship needed for that. Because that's not the Jesus model. The Jesus model wasn't make it look very impressive and hope out of that impressiveness you can create some substance underneath. The Jesus model was go create some substance in the hidden place so that that could impact as many people as possible in the future. He had his three most intimate people. He had his 12 apostles. He had his 70 disciples. He appeared to 500 people after his resurrection. And then from that, it's touched billions of lives over the centuries to where we are today. That's, we need to change the whole way we think about it. So over the next seven weeks, we're going to cover seven things we're going to do one today, so that's my really long intro, and then uh, we'll, we'll do the others over the weeks to come. We're going to talk about how marks of emotional healthy discipleship, people who be before you do, who follow the crucified Christ, not the westernized Jesus, bless me, bless me, Jesus, embrace God's gift of limits. You know, God put a tree in the garden that you weren't allowed to eat from. There's limits in our lives, there are blessings, not him holding back from us. Discover treasures hidden in grief and loss. Make love the measure of maturity. That's our number one value here. Aroha. Break the power of the past and learn to lead out of weakness and vulnerability so we can say what Paul would say over his life. Where I am weak, he is strong. So I don't need to hide all of my weaknesses. Let's pray, eh? As we go on this journey, I pray you'd come with me on it. Heavenly Father, thank you for all of the facets that you have made of us. Thank you that we are beautifully and wonderfully made. Thank you that we are created through your son Jesus and we're being recreated in relationship with him. Lord, lead us on the path of life everlasting. Lord, point out anything in us, as Psalm 139 says, that would uh, offend you. Lord, know us. Point out things in us that you might lead us to that whole life in you. This we pray in the name of your Son, Jesus. Amen. Amen. Be before you do. Are there any doers out there? I'm a doer. It says doers anonymous. Not so anonymous. Raise your hand. No, no, just... Do us. Luke chapter 10, verse 38. Now, as they went on their way, Jesus entered a village. And a woman named Martha, ooh, welcomed him into her house. And she had a sister called Mary, yay, who sat at the Lord's feet and listened to his teaching. This is what the, what the Bible's trying to say, who sat like a disciple. Posture of discipleship. But Martha, boo, was distracted with much serving, with much doing, with much fulfilling her cultural role. And she went up to him and said, Lord, do you not care that my sister has left me to serve all alone? Tell her to help me. But the Lord answered her, Martha, Martha, you are anxious and troubled about many things. But one thing is necessary, and Mary has chosen the good portion, which will not be taken away from her. Which best describes you? Are you a Martha? Too much to do with too little time? Or are you a Mary, sitting in the posture of discipleship? Theologically, the story sits right after the parable of the Good Samaritan. And the two, Luke, wants us to read them together. And Jesus is using these two stories, these two illustrations, to tell us about the great commandment. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. 
And the second is like it, love your neighbor as yourself. And the Good Samaritan story illustrates what it means to love your neighbor. And Luke uses and Jesus uses the unlikely hero of the despised Samaritan to illustrate his point. And then we get to this, what does it mean to love the Lord your God with all of your might? And Luke uses the story of an unlikely hero, this woman, Mary. In their culture, women had a role to fill. We can't talk about that these days, can we? And we will not. But in her culture, women could not become disciples of rabbis. Women had a role to play. They kept the home, they kept the house, they did the hospitality. And so the thought of a woman being a disciple is like shameless. It's never happened before. There are cultural expectations at play. One woman is playing her cultural role, Martha, and the other is found in the posture of a discipleship. How scandalous, Mary. One person is letting her culture decide her role and her priorities and what's important, but the other is acting countercultural and radical to the cultural norms, and Jesus celebrates it. Her sister, Martha, wants Jesus to point out the shamefulness of her choices to go such against the cultural tide that she would bring shame on her family, but instead she rebukes the cultural norms and celebrates Mary for putting first things first. Man, it brings to mind for me the parable of the sower, where the Word of God is like a seed thrown in different places, and one of the places the seed falls, it falls amongst the thorny or weedy soil, and it grows up, and it looks like a plant, and it looks all good, but it bears no fruit because it is choked out by the cares and worries of life in the preoccupation of riches and treasure. And if there is no, that has got to be the seed for today's Christian. The seed that looks like a Christian, that comes to church like a Christian, but is choked out by all of the cultural expectations, the cares and worries, the lure of wealth, and there is no fruit. But I want to say, because I'm a a Martha for sure. Like even on holiday, my question is, what are we doing next? What I want to say for all you, like I love reading a good book, for all you book readers... For all you chillers, for you people that have no problem sleeping in and, you know, just cruising, doing nothing's a great idea of a day for you. It doesn't mean you're a Mary. (laughs) All of the laughs were from the Marthas. (laughs) Because Mary is not defined by her not doing. She's defined by her posture of being with Jesus. And there's a difference between the two. There are many modern day examples. You might be saying, oh, being with God before we do for God. Well, I don't do for God like a pastor does for God. I want to let you know that your whole life is doing for God. Colossians says that whatever you do for work, Colossians 3 verse 22 verse 23 says, well, whatever you do for work, work as if it's unto the Lord as if the Lord is actually your boss and treat it like you're working for Him. Corinthians talks about your whole life, your eating, sleeping, going around, ordinary day life, offer it to God in worship. So whether you realize it or not, and whether you're good at it or not, your whole life, everything you ever do, is doing for God. Building sites and boardrooms, raising families and drinking coffee, it's all doing for God. It's all Him. And I wonder if our doing for God has way outweighted our being for God. In fact, I don't wonder, I know it has. And there's many examples of that in our lives, but most of it would look simply like this. We glance at God through the day, maybe if we're lucky. We say a prayer in the car on the way to something because we're in such a hurry we don't even have time to not pray on the go. We like listen to a little bit of worship music. 
We might read the verse of the day if it remembers to notify us. And we'll forget it two minutes later. And we'll find ourselves over the day increasingly less present with ourselves, with God, and with the people around us. We'll find anxiety rises, reactions increase. And we'll get to the end of the day and go, where were you, God? With no sense of his presence with us. That is not what Jesus meant by the full life. And I know many of us want this idea of a slower life. The entire world's being reshaped at the moment. I was just reading an article even this morning about how work culture is being redefined. People, just the whole thing's in upheaval. Like people want to do less, yet we're all doing more. Yeah, we're connected more. We're doing more. And I know we want We want that sense of being with God, that this being, our doing comes from this being, but we cannot get it at the pace of life that most of us are used to running. Well-formed discipleship and emotional health cannot happen on the go. It cannot happen in a rush. Like Mary, our life must first be ordered by putting God first. I want you to imagine with me a way of living that's living from the fullness of His grace. His grace is His empowerment to us to help us live with Him and live for Him. It allows us to become who we couldn't become on our own through our own effort alone. And it allows us to experience Him in our daily experience. I want you to imagine living from the fullness of that in every moment of your life. If you've ever had a moment where you got through something or you interacted with something and you had that sense of God's grace being with you, imagine that over every minute of your day. That's how Jesus lived. And him discipling us as he wants us to have that too. People can often think that the like grace is something that as we mature, we need less of it because we get more betterer. It's like, no, no, I'm nailing this Jesus thing. I don't need as much grace anymore. But the reality is, is that the life full in Christ is the life that starts to experience God's grace in everything, not in less things. It's when you are living with Him in that way, living with the fullness of a sense that God is with me right now in the good and the bad and the ugly where there's no sense of where are you, God, but actually God is here with me. And I want us to experience that. Have you ever had those moments where you've gone away on a decent holiday and you've come back and everything's different? You know, you get back into it. It doesn't last long. Let's just acknowledge that. But you know, like you come back and it's like you're more aware. You know, it's like you're aware of yourself and everything. Hopefully I'm not talking too cryptically. And you're like, you're more aware of others. You're, you're actually listening to them and you're noticing how they might be feeling rather than just talking at each other. Or like somebody says something and it tries to throw off your day and your mood, but it just like, it just, it falls away. You're like, oh, that's more about them than me. Like this, when you get back from a holiday self, this healthy self, this grounded self, this present self, That's part of what God wants you to have in your daily experience of life. That's part of emotionally healthy discipleship. So here's my big idea around being before you do. It's that our presence is our greatest gift. It's our greatest gift to God. It's our greatest gift to others. And it's their greatest gift to ourselves. We often think, I need to do all of these things for God. And there's no doubt there are things for you to do for God but they're supposed to be secondary to you first being with God. God doesn't want the stuff done. He wants you first. And from that place, you can do some stuff together. From that place, you can minister. From that place, you can parent. From that place, you can work. From that place, you can walk with that friend. From that place, you can fulfill your purpose in life. It's our gift to Him. It's our gift to others. It's our gift to ourselves. There's a lot of stuff written about leadership, but some of the most fundamental things is that the number one key to being a great leader in any environment has got nothing to do with technique. 
It's got to do with your presence. Just being a non-anxious presence in an anxious world will have far more impact than any decision you could ever make for anything. We we'll put the, that up. Yeah, it's fantastic. What represents you? Busy Christians, merry, flaky Christians. Busy Christians, merry, Jesus model, or people have gone too far the other way and they're no good to society or anyone else. <laughs> Just be super honest about it. Because it's not one or the other, it's a balance. Part of the reaction to these times is that more and more people want to go and retreat from the world. They want to become self-sustaining. They just want to get their land and just have their time and just be their own person and just be with God and be with their family. and just be. That's not a good citizen. That's not a good Christian. That's running away from the problems of this world and going from one extreme to the other extreme. We actually have to learn to live in the world where our being shapes our doing because we do have things to do as well. I could chime on about that for about 10 messages, but I won't. There's a right type of active life in this world for God that can only flow from a deep inner life with God. And we have to admit this is harder than ever before, right? It's harder because of those stupid phones. Because even when you're with somebody, somebody else is trying to be with you. And even when you're present at home, something vibrating on the kitchen bench. And even when you're just by yourself, you're so, it's so second nature, it's so habit, it's so dopamine, it's so subconscious that without even thinking about it, you just go, and you unlock it, and you, you're not looking for anything, you don't need it, but you find yourself there, and you're like, I've read this news bulletin 10 times already today, I don't need to see it again, but here I am, because it's so habitual, that it's hard to be present, it's hard to be before we do. There's so many expectations. Marys were, our Marthas and Marys were around the cultural expectations of womanhood in her time. But we have cultural expectations about what it means to raise a family, how many activities our kids should be into, all the things we should be a part of, how much money we should have made by now, what sort of house we should live in, what the decor should look like. We have these expectations about our wardrobes, the expectations around how many recreational activities do you need to have to be healthy. It's at least 16. You know, like it's like we have all of these things that you're supposed to be at and all these podcasts you're supposed to have listened to and all these series you're supposed to have binged and you know, all of these expectations that we feel like we're constantly behind in life that we're trying to fit into. It's tough. And then we have more options. It's not like, you know, when we get home in the evening, it's like, oh, there's just like dinner and feed the kids or whatever your season of life is and then, you know, read a book of bed. Now you've got like 10 million shows you could watch on six different streaming opportunities, on four different types of devices. And that's just when you're at home. There's so many options. It's so hard to choose the thing that doesn't have any feelings associated with it when we're so used to being led by our feelings, isn't it? Isn't it so hard to go, actually, why don't I just spend half an hour with God? Get my Bible out and just sit with Him. Because... There's no dopamine with that. There's no like, oh, I'm just going to blur with that. It's got all of the centeredness on the other end, but it's got none of the addictiveness on the front end. It's tough. So how do we move towards being people who be before we do? Well, the first thing is, is we need radical change. We just need radical change. So often I say to people, just take baby steps, just take little things. But with this, baby steps will just lead you where the last baby step led you, to the same place you're already at. Radical change. 
you have to look at your life through the lens of who am I becoming, not what do I need to get done. And you need to schedule who you want to become before you schedule what needs to get done. If you ever want to become a different type of person, you have to say to God, I need to reorder my life like Mary. You know, if, if work or activity, or being on the go as an idol, resting with God will always feel like a sin. And I'm afraid that's where our culture's got to. If we're going to move towards this, we don't just need radical change, we need to be more engaged with our feelings. Bad news, gentlemen. We need to be more engaged with them. We don't need to ignore them less. We need to question them. We need to take them to God. We need to ask the question, why am I in such a hurry? I'm not even running late. Now, why am I driving and weaving in and out of the lanes trying to get there as quick as possible? Why am I pushing the speed limit even though I don't need to be somewhere? Why am I always in a hurry? Why am I so impatient? Where's all this anxiety coming from and what's it about? Why am I so angry underneath? Why am I on the defense? Why am I avoiding conflict? Why do I feel like I need to be a part of all of these things? Why do I feel like I needed to be somewhere that I'm not in my life yet? We need to ask these questions and go, where does that come from? And we need to ask those questions with God so that He can take those feelings and they can be replaced and reshaped in Him. And His presence is for that. So we need to integrate silence. Silence and solitude are the great, well-worn pathways to inner transformation. If Jesus needed 40, years, 40 weeks in the desert, 40 days in the desert of silence and solitude, we probably need 40 weeks. We need at least a few days every now and then, don't we? Like if that was critical for him. And silence, silence is the most uncomfortable thing in our noisy world. But you need a breakthrough for about a day before it starts having its impact. In that place, you surrender to God's will. You let go of your agenda. You begin to commune with God. You begin to feel things you've never felt before and see things you've never seen before. In silence, you let go and God grabs a hold. In silence, we stop talking and God starts speaking and we might start hearing and we need to commune with Jesus throughout the day. You know, our, our Christian traditions are fantastic, but as I said, our charismatic and evangelical ones are a bit weak for transformation. When somebody goes, well, what do you need to do to be transformed? They probably just said, you need to have a devotional time with God every morning, some time with God, and then we've relaxed that to the time that works for your personality. It's BS. It doesn't work. Even if you've nailed a devotional time with God in the morning, you would have noticed it's worn off by about morning tea, that you've completely forgotten Him, that you've gotten on with the day. And so there are well-worn paths of how we do these things. There are things called like fixed hour prayer. That's like just picking the times in the day where you pray at those times just for a few minutes to recenter. There are things like praying the eximen, a way of reflecting on the day with God. And I think these things are powerful, whether it's the building side or the boardroom or parenting or kids running around a classroom or whatever it is. These are within reach for every person to have a sense of God throughout my day, not just God in a part of my day. And we need markers of when we're straying. How do you know when you're straight? How do you know when you're not doing out of your being with God? Well, here's some of the ones I know. I feel them in myself and they're great indicators. I can't shake the pressure of having too much to do with too little time. Every time I feel that, I know I'm not living from being with God because he gave me the exact right amount of things to do with the exact amount of time he's given me. I know when I'm ignoring stress and tightness in my body, normally up here for me or down here, and I'm just pushing through, 
I know I'm not coming out of my being with God, but I'm pressing on with all the doing. I know when I start getting overly concerned about what others think and feeling insecure that I'm not living out of my being with God. I know when I start being fearful of the future, not hopeful and full of faith for the future, my being with God is not where it should be. When I'm rushing, when I'm defensive, when I'm easily offended, ah, oh, the doing has outweighed the being. When I'm preoccupied, distracted, not able to be in a conversation, the doing has outweighed the being. When I feel threatened by others' success, or at least unenthusiastic about others' success, oh, the doing has outweighed the being. When I'm spending more time talking than listening, the doing has outweighed the being. So where do we go from here? Well, radical change for sure. Try some new practices, but get in your groups this week and make a plan for some change. Adjust some priorities, adjust some expectations, try some fixed hour prayer, and be patient because it takes time. If you can get better at this, you'll be better at marriage, you'll be better at family, you'll be better at team, you'll be better at group, you'll be better at work, and this whole church will be better. Look, the reality is, is I'm still struggling with burnout. Almost two years on, every day. I feel it in my body, I feel it in my mind, I feel it in my emotions. Fight or flight is only ever a very small margin away inside myself. But I'm here. I'm leading, not perfectly, but I'm trying. I'm pastoring, I'm teaching. On top of all of that, I'm trying to become less performance oriented, more loving, more kind. I'm more present at home. I'm a better husband and father and friend. And I'm not saying any of this, you know me, to blow my own trumpet. Because I haven't arrived. There isn't actually a place to arrive. But I wouldn't still be here if I hadn't rebuilt my life around being way more than I do. I wouldn't have made it and I wouldn't still be making it. And I know there's people here going through what I'm going through in their own ways. I know there's people here feeling like they're going towards what I'm going through in their own ways. And I know that there's people here that if you don't change it, you will inevitably get to where I am in your own way. But it doesn't have to be that way. We need to start by rebuilding our life around being with God before we do for God in our lives and experience the radical transformation that comes even when life might get worse around you. It can get better 